So, Parashat Ki Tissa this week, and as we are sandwiched in the middle of the two Mishkan Parashiot that we've just been looking at, and we are before the final two Parashiot, which we'll read as a double parasha next week for Yaakov Pekudeh, which also deal with the Mishkan. This parsha seems to be a combination. The first few topics all seem to be Mishkan related. We're going to talk about those in a second. And then comes the climax or perhaps the tragedy, um, which is, of course, the golden calf. And then that sort of eclipses anything else we've just read about. Now, generally, we look at the parsha and we say, okay, all the topics that are brought at the beginning that are all to do with the Mishkan, that's because we're talking about the Mishkan, and then it all went horribly wrong. But actually, if we look at it in a different way, we know that the Torah is not written in chronological order. Therefore, what most of the commentators think happened is that the golden calf came first. And therefore, the topics that are brought to us at the beginning of the parsha are actually, if we look at them in their real, with, with the depth that they require, they're actually perhaps being presented as the antidote or the way forward in the aftermath of the golden calf. With me? But what's the obvious question? If that's the case, Okay, let's take a step back for a minute. Let's talk about what our topics are. So we begin with Kiti Sa'et Rosh B'nai Israel, which is the importance of having needing to count the people. However, in Judaism, we don't count people directly, and therefore they were counted by every person having to give a half a shekel. That's topic number one. Topic number two is that there was going to be a sink. This sink would be used every time the Kohanim came to serve in the temple. They would need to wash their hands and wash their feet. And it says several times that they should do so, so that they don't die. So this was clearly something that was quite significant. And that's topic number two, the copper sink. Topic number three is the incense that was brought with all the various spices that were put into the incense. And topic number four is Shabbat. And in the middle, it also speaks about the wisdom of the architects who built the Mishkan, but we're gonna skip over that for, for this evening, even though it actually still does fit into the, into the template, okay? Now, my suggestion is that when we look at each one of these four topics, it is brought in the aftermath of the golden calf as a way of plotting the, um, the way forward from the golden calf, how to avoid the pitfall of the disaster of what happened with the golden calf. If that's the case, then why would you put it first? Right? If this is, if this is the, the, the medicine or the cure for what went wrong, then put it afterwards. So why does it come before? Well, I'd suggest two answers. One is a very technical answer, which is if we're speaking about the technicalities of the Mishkan, let's put them there. So it makes sense that they're couched at the beginning. It's a very technical answer. But a more mystical answer, which is a concept that's brought in the Talmud in several places, and you'll probably be, many of you will be familiar with, is that we, we say that the Rufu'ah is always present before the Makkah. The antidote is always existent in the world. It might be hidden before the problems start. And so actually by putting it before the golden calf, even though it was laws that were only given afterwards, it's very subtly reminding us of that message. So how is it that these four topics serve as the antidote to the golden calf? Let's begin by looking at the machatzit shekel, the giving of the half coin, of the half shekel. So we normally say, okay, this is a technical counting. We don't want to count people by literally counting them. Let them give a half shekel. 
But when we look at the words that are used, there seems to be something much deeper that's actually going on. I'm going to share my screen. And Okay, can you see it? I'm gonna go a little bit. Here we go. Okay. So I'm gonna just ask various questions, but I think that these questions, the language here is all important that it's easy for us to fob this off as, as a kind of Jewish version of a census. But actually, there's something much more significant that a message, a philosophical message, um, almost a mantra that's being given to the Jewish people at this point in time. So we pick up from over here. This is the very beginning of our parasha. Well, it actually starts one verse earlier when it says the Lord spoke to Moses saying, here's the um, command to take a census. Ki tisa et rosh b'nei Yisrael lifkudehem. Literally, this means when you lift up the heads of B'nai Israel. If you wanted to say, and that colloquial, colloquially means, count B'nai Israel, take a census. But if you wanted to say that, then why didn't it just say pakod, which is the normal word we would use for count them? Instead of this kind of very poetic, when you lift up the heads of B'nai Israel, and then it continues to say ish kofer Hashem, that a person in giving their half coin is giving an atonement for their soul. And it finishes off the verse by saying, negef, and there won't be a plague bifkodotam. And then there won't be a plague when they are counted. So there seems to be much more to the giving of this half shekel than just literally giving the half shekel. It's something about lifting up one's head. There's something about an atonement. And there's something about it preventing a plague. By the way, what's going to be the tragedy after the golden calf? What's going to happen? It ends in a plague. So you can see the clues that this is an antidote. It's saying if you don't want another golden calf, then do machatzit a shekel. Make sure people give their half a shekel. And then it continues to give exactly the protocol of how this should work, that everybody should give a half, a shekel, that it goes from the age of 20 and upwards. And then the very famous uh, line, ha'ashir lo yirbeh, the, poor, uh, the rich person shouldn't give any more, v'hadal lo yamit, and a poor person cannot give less. There is something about having this standard measure that everybody should do it. And once again, you can see the end of this verse, to atone for your souls. And so therefore, I ask, what is behind this giving of the half a shekel? It can't <laughs> simply be about people being counted. It seems to be more than that. Is it something Go on, about the coin and money being something really the lowest, something really physical, and it's about something to do with the connection with something really spiritual, and so that that, that, that's yeah it's it's something about the physicality of it the lowest of the low and and the sort of always looking upwards on giving okay. up okay yeah very nice and um and we're actually going to come back to this idea of the physicality and the spirituality when we touch upon the the, the copper sink and um, which is of course the next one in our list in a moment okay Karen says it sounds like a recipe for a religious community why so sorry um it's um because you've got the um kind of you know giving something so everyone has to give because you've got this idea of you know rich people shouldn't give more and probably like this kind of leveling you've got um keep poor you know the the sort of um uh, atoning for your soul so it you know there's a spiritual element there there's just it seems like you know the like this like you said it's like the antidote to the golden calf so instead of idol worship it's kind of building that faith community and it seems like a lot of ways of doing that yeah, and one of them is to have kind of a leveler, yeah. almost. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the Arachayim 
<clears throat> living in, in, in Morocco in the 16th century, says, when you think about how the people were feeling after the golden calf, can you imagine the morale, the disappointment? He actually says that, um, you know, sin is something that brings you down. It's like gravity. It, it, it sort of has a natural property to almost make the head, you know, be bowed in, uh, you know, in despair. And this is how the people were feeling. What's the first thing they're told? It's time to lift your head. The way that we can do that is by you bringing a half shekel. And that's why it's an atonement, because it's directly atoning for the golden calf. Question is, well, why would that be through giving a half a shekel? So in order to answer that question, let's look. There is one time before in Tanakh that we have seen this same phrase used. Da, da, da. Anybody? Okay, I will do the big reveal. I know you are all waiting in suspense. What's it going to be? So I'll give you a clue while I'm bringing my, while I'm uh, finding my share screen, which is that um, if we think back to two people who were put into prison and at a certain point in time, they were brought out of prison. Is it uh, sounding familiar? Joseph. That's it, exactly. So in the Joseph story, when the butler and the baker, they were put into prison, and when it comes to taking them out, you'll see, very interestingly, the exact same phrases used. Um, here we go. It was on the third day. By the way, this is the first and the only birthday we hear about in the Tanakh. And he made a feast for all of his servants. Vayisa et rosh sar hamashkim et rosh sar ha'ofim v'tochavadav, and he counted the butler and the baker amongst his servants, and therefore he brings them out of prison. And of course, what's going to happen? The butler will be reinstated. The baker is going to unfortunately, you know, go and and uh, it will will face execution. But it doesn't say he counted them. Once again, it says he, he lifted up their heads. And this is what triggered them being reinstated or you know, having to come to judgment. So what's happening here? The Rabbeinu Bukhai writing in France in the 11th century says, what this is saying to us is that when a person is counted, that is, he's now suddenly doing like an inventory of all his employees. He's planning his birthday, what everybody's job's going to be. Once he's doing that, he's looking at all the different roles. And he remembers, ah, I've got a butler and a baker. They're sitting in prison. Once he's counted them, that is the trigger to bringing them out and to judging them. And so Rabbeinu Bukhai says what this shows us is that when a person is counted, they are accountable. Being counted means that you are accountable. Why would this be the antidote to the golden calf or the answer in the aftermath to moving forward? Because on the one hand, being accountable is scary because you're being judged. And, uh, you know, as we see with the butler and the baker, on the other hand, there's a sense of being needed. There's a sense of empowerment. And so by coming and saying, every single person is going to give the same amount, yet with that, it's not just give it, but it's an atonement for their soul. They have to come and as they're giving it, there is some kind of a mindful process where they are actually thinking about their own role, about their own fulfillment. And so what happens is that that leveler or that uniform measure that every person is giving, which is very bland and very plain, and why do I matter? Because I'm just giving a half a shekel. It doesn't recognize my own talents and my own contributions. It's supposed to trigger one's own individual process. But the starting point is that every single person can make a difference. Why is that important? Because what had happened at the golden calf 
The trigger for the golden calf was that Moses had gone up the mountain, they had miscalculated, comes to day number 40 and they come to Aaron and they say, make us a God because the, our leader Moses, we don't know what's happened to him. I.e. they weren't trying to replace God, they were over-reliant on their leadership. Without their leadership, they had no sense of self. The Machat Shekel comes as the antidote to say, it's not about your leadership. It's about you. It's about every individual understanding that they have a value, they have a worth, they have a role. Of course, you need leadership. But if you're just relying on the leader all the time, you're missing your value. And this is a theme that we've seen throughout the weeks in the Mishkan, this constant reminder that everybody has their function to play. But it seems that it wasn't enough because the golden calf is that reminder that actually without the leader, they were sort of acting almost as sheep that were just being led all the time. The Machatzi Ashekel comes to say, no, that's not the kind of system we're looking at. We're looking for a system where every person is active. And not only that, that's why everybody gives the same to show everybody in different ways but everybody is giving an equal value of themselves in terms of functioning together as a community. So this is where Machatzit Shekel, when we read it carefully, we see how actually its message is so much deeper than just needing to recount the people after the plague following the golden calf. It's actually refocusing them. It's allowing them to find their way again, to realize how if they find their own individual value and their own moral compass, they won't need to be led astray. They won't need to panic if anything would ever happen again. Let's move briefly, just briefly touch on our other topics to show how they really corroborate and emphasize this message. We said that the next, um, uh, the next episode that we have, the next few lines is dedicated to the copper basin, which is something that is used every day. And it was actually the, um, it was the uh, vessel that was made last, but actually the materials for it were collected first because what, where did it come from? What was it made from? The copper for the basin. It was made from the women's mirrors that they had had in Egypt. And for this reason, when it's brought again in Vayakel Pekude, um, uh, um, Moses, the Midrash there says that Moshe didn't want to accept the mirrors from the women. Going back to what Jeremy said, he said, this is something that's so physical. This is something that was used to lure their husbands to you know, uh, uh, procreate even during the time of slavery. Why are we using these mirrors for temple service, which is all about spirituality? And the message came back loud and clear. First of all, those mirrors were used for, for the purpose of the Jewish people had only continued thanks to those mirrors. But also because it doesn't have to be something that's so high. A person's contribution doesn't need to be something that's so lofty and so spiritual. It needs to come with the heart of wanting to contribute. And it can be the most lowly physical thing. And so the, the copper basin coming now at this juncture, even though we're going to see it again next week, comes alongside the machatzit shekel to say, it doesn't matter what your contribution might be. It might be something that feels very physical and almost crass. It's still a worthwhile contribution. This then is followed up by the incense, the katarets, and the whole combination of... Um, of the, the different spices that were used. We get very excited because of course, one of the spices was Kitsi'a, which is Kezi, my sister-in-law's name. Um, so she likes to think of herself as a spice girl, but this is where it actually comes from in the Tanakh that she was one of the spices. She was, she was one of the spices that was put into the mix of the, of the incense. Um, so it has a personal uh, read when we read through the list of items. But again, what's the deeper significance? that the incense wasn't one particular herb that was burnt, it was a combination. It was the combination of th that special mix of the various spices that went together to form the katarat. Now, by the way, the katarat was something that was used to stop plagues. 
So again, it coming here is clearly also a, a sort of, you know, that antidote, for example, when there was the plague later on, and you've got the famous scene where Aaron had to go and stand in between the, the dead and, and the living. And he stood there with the pans of incense until the plague stopped. It's a very poignant scene. Um, and so over here, it's reminder again is the society that we're part of is only beautiful when it's made up of different spices. And we can look and say, oh, I'm not a Moses. What am I without Moses? But actually this reminds us, no, you are one spice and you might feel like you're nothing alone, but put you with a few other spices, you'll be the most incredible mixture. And that's the mixture of the Qataris. And then finally we get to Shabbat. Shabbat takes us right back to the vision that came at the beginning of the creation of the world. And that was that God didn't create a perfect world. He created a world that was left imperfect, right? As we say in the Kiddush um, every week, that he created a world in order for people, la'asot, right? To do it, to complete it. Human beings were put in the world to form a partnership with God. And when we stop on Shabbat, that is our moment to actually remember our nature as creative human beings, or in Rav Soloveitchik's words, you call it Adam one, is, you know, to create, to be there, to be out there, to be building. When you're in Adam one mode, it's very easy to forget you're in that partnership and to be a faithful person. It's a very uh, delicate balance to strike, to have Adam one and Adam two, which is what he calls the lonely man of faith existing together. So by having Shabbat, which of course comes here, this is where we learn all the malachot from, from Shabbat, because it was a way of God saying, even though you think you're so busy with the Mishkan and it's this incredible project, don't think it's more important than Shabbat. Because Shabbat's our moment to recall that we're in a partnership. But that partnership is one that requires us to be active participants. And so therefore, these topics all come together in the aftermath of the golden calf. As society is suddenly, can you imagine it's 40 days since they got the Torah at Sinai. And in one, you know, in a, in a day's madness, they suddenly feel that they have undone everything. Right? It's easy to destroy things. You suddenly look around, you say, what have I done? I've just destroyed, you know, a month's work in one, in one, one word that I said bad about somebody. I've destroyed years of friendship, right? In this moment, they suddenly say, what have we done? The tablets are sitting in shards, destroyed and shattered. We've gone against everything that we entered into, everything that had made us into a people, made us unique. Is there any way back? From here, God comes to them and he reminds them, Mahatzit HaShakel, every single one of you is important. And if you can find your own worth and realize that each one of you is a significant actor in this society, that way we can avoid another golden calf. It's interesting, even just looking at the last year, you know, generally, um, or at least I think that when we look back, the kind of golden moments have been those initiatives where we felt like community have come together. Where, whether it's been, you know, people clubbing together to help the NHS or, you know, a shul, a shul project or whatever. It hasn't been when one person has gone out there and has made a name for themselves and has shone. That's generally not the thing that rehabilitates our soul. That really, it might give us a, um, an ego trip or make us feel good when we suddenly find our moment to shine. But generally the thing that gives us that sense of fulfillment and purpose is when we feel needed in a bigger group. When our skills are being used as part of something bigger that's plugging into the bigger picture. And that's what the Machatzit HaShakel captures. It says all of you have equal value, but it's not just about coming and giving a coin. You have to come and when you give the coin, go through your own process. Find your own meaning. 
think about your own journey of how you came to follow the crowd to serve the golden calf, how you could avoid that, how you could find your own self-worth. And that's how you avoid the catastrophe of the golden calf. And that message is then emphasized by saying, okay, you might not be the Moses in society. Your contribution might not be that of the praying and the learning all the time, but just like the copper sink was given from the mirrors of the women that all came together in tiny pieces to form the copper sink. That would be the thing that purified the Kohanim every single day when they came to serve in the temple. Nothing is too low. It just needs to come with that sense of purpose and the heart. That is then followed up by the beautiful, lovely smelling incense that was going to be at the heart of the temple service that didn't come from one pure blend. Actually, it didn't come from one pure herb, but rather it came from that blend, which is a symbol of what society should be, of blending everything together to form that combination. And finally, we come back to Shabbat. Because Shabbat not only takes us back to the vision of us being active partners with Hashem, but it also gives the people a practical way forward. It's easy to feel inspired in one moment. It's easy to stand, stand around Mount Sinai and say, this is what I want to be. 40 days later, they've fallen. So it's easy to say, okay, fine. You've given me a way back. Now I know how I can do this. But you know what? Life and the world is a complicated place. Shabbat gives us the opportunity every single week to have almost a mini machatita shekel moment, that opportunity to stand together and yet alone, to be able to think about our own unique contribution and the partnership that we form with Hashem. So oh, I wanted to try to do this week, even though we didn't go into any of the nitty gritty of the golden calf, was essentially to be able to see how often, you know, we have all these various topics in the parsha that seem to almost be, you know, uh, chosen at random or coming as standalones. But actually, there seems to be a beautiful continuum of setting us up both with the pitfalls, but how to get back up again. And that, of course, is, is a, a timeless message for us in our lives at any point in time. Um, next week is the last week in our series um, as we bring the Book of Shemot together to a close. So hope to see you then.